with introducing our coordinator. It is my privilege to extend a warm welcome to the unwavering force behind today's webinar, Dr. Alka Patel, an intellectual powerhouse and a pillar of the legal fraternity. Dr. Alka Patel dons multiple hats as an assistant professor of law at the prestigious University of Mumbai. Her expertise spans a diverse array of subjects, including constitutional law, administrative law, and human rights in India. Armed with a formidable PhD in law and a diploma in cyber law, Dr. Alka Patel brings a wealth of knowledge and insights to her role. In addition to her teaching responsibilities, Ma'am has made a lasting contribution to the legal field through her research initiatives and writings and fascinating talks at both national and international conferences. Dr. Alka Patil is the key person who has put together this wonderful webinar with our esteemed speaker, Dr. Professor Adolfo Paolini, for us today. As a teacher, she has worked hard to make sure that this webinar will be informative and thought-provoking. Please join me in giving our sincere thanks and appreciation to Dr. Alka Patil for organizing this web webinar. Ma'am, we are grateful that you scheduled this insightful event for us today. Thank you for bringing us all together. Please accept our sincere gratitude expressed virtually. Thank you very much, Ms. Prachi, for the fantastic introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar, where it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Adolfo Polini, joining us from the United Kingdom, London. Dr. Polini is a leading expert on environmental, social, and governance regulations and their implications across Europe and the UK. In this highly informative webinar, he will provide a comprehensive overview of the rapidly evolving ESG legal landscape in this region. As we all are aware, 2024 has brought significant shifts in the regulatory environment of both the European Union and the United Kingdom. While these two entities have distinct framework, there are areas where they, they find common ground amidst their diverging path post Brexit. Dr. Polini will guide us in, in highlighting the major regulatory and legislative changes that occur in 2023, as well as what to expect throughout 2024 across crucial areas such as trade, sustainability, sanction, AI, data privacy, antitrust, chemicals, food safety, criminal enforcement and legal disputes. The primary objective of this webinar is to equip students with valuable insights into navigating the challenges and capitalizing on the opportunity presented by these evolving regulations. Through expert data on such each subject area, Dr. Polini aims to educate us in achieving compliance and maintaining a competitive edge while pursuing growth strategies in the European operations. Please join me in virtual felicitation and welcoming Dr. Adolfo, uh, Adolfo Polini as he shares his expertise on the ESG legal landscape, empowering us to stay ahead of the curves in this rapidly changing regulatory climate. Welcome Dr. Adolfo Polini, sir. Ma'am, I have to give a welcome speech for him. Yeah. Yes. A very good afternoon to all the viewers and dignitaries present over here for the webinar on the topic of the ESG legal landscape in Europe and UK, a very significant and relevant topic in the modern world. So I take this extremely privileged opportunity with great pleasure and excitement that to extend India, your voice. Vindya, your voice. Are you there? Yeah. 
academia law and consultancy today we pay homage to none other than dr professor adolfo polony sir's journey is not just one of academic excellence but also a testament to relentless dedication and passion for his field with credentials that speak volumes of his commitment to lifelong learning sir has not only earned degrees from esteemed institutions like the university of oxford and cardiff university but has also continuously delved into cutting edge areas such as artificial intelligence and blockchain as a professor in corporate and insurance law at the university of buckingham sir's influence extends far beyond the classroom his leadership as the dean of law coupled with his role as an elected and ex officio member of the senate reflects his de dedication to shaping the future of legal education sir's expect expertise isn't confined to the ivory towers of academia his consultancy positions at renowned firms like clyde and co llp and dsc beechcroft llp underscore his practical insights into the intricate world of insurance law where he has been a guiding force in navigating complex issues of liability and risk management beyond his professional accolades sir's impact resonates globally through his visiting child uh, to india and from italy to the united kingdom sir's insights have enlightened minds and inspired countless individuals across borders and continents his prolific research and publications spanning from books to peer reviewed articles offer invaluable insights into pivotal issues such as directors duties liability insurance and the disruptive effects of emerging technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence moreover sir's present at conferences and seminars where he shares his expertise on topics ranging from esg landscapes to the implications of distributed ledger technology showcases his unwavering uh, commitment to advancing knowledge and fostering dialogue within the legal community in closing i extend my deepest gratitude to dr Prof professor adolfo polony for his unwavering dedication profound insights and invaluable contributions to the fields of law and academia sir your journey serves as an inspiration for to all of us and we are immensely gra grateful for the opportunity to celebrate your achievements today please join me in giving a resounding round of applause to dr professor adolfo polony for his exemplary accomplishments and unwavering commitment to excellence thank you sir welcome sir sir you want to share your ppt You need to enable me to to sharing the the screen, please. Am I sharing now? Yes, sir. Shall I start? Yes, sir, please. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patil, for your kind invitation to join your, your esteemed university, Mumbai. I'm very grateful for this. Um, I, I didn't expect such a 
introduction today, uh, you set the bar quite high uh, with all the accolades you mentioned about me, but, but I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, when you asked me about a, a topic that I, I would like to, to share with you, obviously um, I was motivated by how topical, how important the ESG principles these days are. However, however, we I, I need to, to issue a disclaimer from the outset because it would be impossible in a 45 minutes or so to cover such a massive area of law and, and even beyond the law embedding or, or, or touching upon any other areas of knowledge. In fact, each of the three E, S, or G could give us enough material to have individual sessions. One point that is important to highlight at the beginning as well is that it doesn't matter how the topic is presented and how much we understand either the environment, environmental, social, or governance principles, we are not going to agree on them. There is, also, there is always room for for second guessing uh, or from having or departing from, from well-established opinions. As an example, yesterday I attended a, a conference, an online conference about these matters. And the presenter from the London Business School, very well-known professor, challenged the, the entire principle of ESG. Uh, uh, in other words, the hype behind ESG is not that important because some statistic, statistical studies show that companies which abide to these principles are not generating or growing in terms of profitability. There are other factors that are taken into account. So it's more, it's more of a hype. This is according to him, uh, and not a, a, a real uh, a reality that we are facing. I posted a question to the professor. Uh, sadly, we ran out of time. And I asked them, is it possible that we can measure ESG rankings or metrics by looking at customers' behavior. Is it possible that those companies who are performing well by following ESG principles and reporting obligations uh, are in positively influencing consumers, customers, and the, the, the most appealing they become, well, of course, the higher, larger, the income at the end of the financial year. As a matter of example, I give you one. Uh, last year, I was browsing the, the web because the furniture that we had in, in our house, in the garden, was very deteriorated. And I wanted to buy a new set of furniture. So I was browsing this, uh, this website and my youngest daughter come by and said, Dad, what are, why aren't you looking at that website? Haven't you seen the news about that company, how the company is exploiting employees? How, the com how many claims does the company have in, in, in courts because of violating employees' rights and technically uh, going back to a slavery? And I said, well, I, I'm not privy to that information, but I'm going to look at. And then she concluded and said, listen, I would be very, very disappointed with you if you buy furniture from that company, regardless of how inexpensive or convenient the purchase is. So and that gave me a very good reason to actually move to another website. And, and I ended buying something quite similar. I, I confess a little bit more expensive, yes, but at least I fulfill my daughter's good intention, a goodwill, by saying, sorry, don't contribute to that company who is well apart from what the ESG principles or all those ESG principles that we want to 
to include and not followed or abide by in, in legislation. Of course, he's not a lawyer. I just think, you know, with my, my legal mind in this area. So that is the motivation behind this topic, ESG. Of course, you are fully aware that the United Kingdom, uh, following Brexit, separated from the European Union. Nevertheless, we have retained several rules or principles that uh, are very much identical uh, at both ends. To say nothing about the global ESG landscape, because ESG principles are, as the name stands for, they are pretty much global. And companies need to follow the principles if they want to retain. And this is my personal opinion. If they want to retain a share of the market, they have no option but to be environmentally friendly, social friendly, and adopt and adapt corporate governance structures which follow the basic rules of diversity, inclusion, efficiency, and so on. I was not only going to read it, uh, a book that is uh, very close to me, and I and I I always follow the, these events. Uh, the founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, uh, published a book, um, very interesting one, and I quote it. I'm quoting him, I'm, I'm, and this is probably the springboard for what I want to cover today, and he, he says. Business has now to fully embrace a stakeholder capitalism, which means not only maximizing profits by use their capabilities and resources in cooperation with governments and civil society to address the key issues of this decade. They have to actively contribute to a more cohesive and sustainable world, Klaus Schwab. Now let's assess, let's scrutinize this statement. And it starts by saying, fully embrace a stakeholder capitalism. What does it mean for us as law students, uh, academics, practitioners in this area? Well, what it means is basically that we are looking at a very long or well-established principle in corporate law steaming from something called corporate social responsibility. So the days where corporations were established just to provide or to maximize profits for shareholders alone are pretty much over. There is an element of social responsibility embedded, embedded in the concept of corporations, which means that corporations, regardless of the trade, structure, size, jurisdiction, et cetera, need to go or need to look beyond what the companies do, need to, go, need to look beyond the manufactured product, what they produce or the service they provide. They need to look after the stakeholders. And the stakeholders include not only those who invest in companies, not only those who supply raw materials, not only those who work for the company, but also the extended society, the impact that this service or this manufacturing process will have in the society at large. This is what we understand by a stakeholder capitalism. That means companies need to look outside the boundaries of the company for the well-being of everybody who in one way or another, interacts, benefits with the corporation. And this explains why uh, Mr. Schwab said this means not only maximizing profits, but also using capabilities and resources in cooperation with governments and civil societies. Later on, I will show you how this principle has been embedded in the United Kingdom for, a, for almost 20 years now in the Companies Act 2006, not without some difficulties and criticism. 
as ESG is measured by following specific metrics, rankings, and so on, I thought that it was important for me to, to share some data with today's audience. And this data is being compiled from the Association of Corporate Council and uh, in 2020, in, in its 2020, 2023 survey. But before I explore this in detail, let's look at the graphic in the middle. And you will see uh, three variables, four variables in there. One is called delivering value for customers. And you see that the trend is pretty much flat. So value for, cu for customers, pleasing the customer, is at the aim, at the core center of what business should be doing, being or producing appealing produce that and keeping customers satisfied is what keeps business up and running. At the bottom, you also see supporting outside communities and dealing ethically with suppliers. It seems to me that for the past, Certain number of years, at least from the 2020, the trend is equally flat. So that means that keeping suppliers satisfied or treating them in an equitable and ethical way is what keeps business afloat. But the two variables in the middle are of significant importance. And then you will see how ESG principles are kicking in what companies do. In the red, you will find the maximizing profits, and in the white, investing in employees. And the maximizing profits has a, a trend going downwards, but at the same time, investing employees is going upwards, is going up. And this is no other than the effect that ESG principles is having in corporations, globally speaking. So a stakeholder capitalism or the principle of stakeholder capitalism is now embedded in what companies do. And this stakeholder includes employees. And employees, as part of the structure, needs to be looked after, invested in. Otherwise, the business will not comply with the principles. The business will not be as profitable as expected or used to be in the past. So there is an element of sacrificing profits for the benefits of a stakeholders. And this corroborates what Mr. Schwab said in the initial statement using the previous slide. We are moving from companies which concentrate on max maximizing profits for its shareholders to corporations looking well beyond the boundaries of corporations and providing benefits with the stakeholders at large. Then some data to share. Uh, on the left-hand side, you will see that 21% of the chief legal officers in these companies expect legal challenges related to climate and environmental changes. That means it's a very large percentage uh, of, of, of lawyers expecting uh, claims and challenges with climate and environmental. 32% of the chief legal officers in public companies with specific trade in finance and banking, and 20% of those in manufacturing reported pressure from investors for taking a stand or re refraining to do so on social and political matters. Very interesting data. Investors, shareholders in companies, pressuring the board of directors and forcing the board of directors for restraining of taking a stance or expressing views in political matters or social matters. And 57%, and this is even larger percentage, indicated that the department, or the department sorry, had increased its expenditures for regulatory compliance, including ESG. And part of this regulatory compliance is reflected in the chart that we see in the middle when we look at how much investment is being poured 
on improving the skills and development of employees. So in general, the, according to the survey 2023, the focus on ESG is based on six different, let's call it bullet points. The changing regulation on emissions, customers and investors pressures, customers focus on ESG related to the supply chain, customers pressure on carbon neutral plans, demands for transparency, environmental compliance requirements, and so on. I expect, or I believe, that some of the cases we refer to, uh, or disputes we refer to, concern pollution, greenwashing, and so on. Something that we could, or I could cover briefly during this presentation. Now, focusing on regulation itself, uh, I said um, at the beginning that we, we may need uh, more than one seminar to cover e each of the ES and Gs here. And these probably give you a taste of how vast this area in law, especially in law, we are talking about regulation, of course, is. So let's look at the environmental aspect, uh, how much regulation could be behind only E in the equation. So you find, you find, for example, in the United Kingdom, large companies to include energy use and carbon emissions in annual reports. You find soft law, internationally speaking, the United Kingdom tax force on climate-related financial disclosures, or TCFD, from 2022, requires ESG disclosures, and this is, in, this is posing on companies a very large cost, these disclosures. You find annual pollution report for companies operating in relevant industries. You find high energy uses, mass produce a report on usage, mandatory climate-related financial disclosures, and so on. Everything, the boom behind environment, behind climate change. Disclosures, reports, is the aim of the regulation. Of course, transparency is an issue. Greenwashing is an issue. Misrepresentation is an issue, something that we can see in a minute or so. In S, in the equation, we find a slavery and human trafficking reporting for specific companies. You find gender pay gap reporting for companies with more than 250 employees. And you find ESG reporting in line with non-financial reporting directive in line with what Europe has established. That is the social aspect of the equation. And in terms of governance, and it will take me, uh, well, it, it may take more than one session to cover governance across Europe and the UK, and only highlighting the UK aspect of the governance. And there are two aspects in there that I would like the audience to know. And one is the enactment in 2011 of the Stewardship Code, now 2020, Principle 7, and the Company Act 2006, I cannot believe that it's almost 20 years old. It makes me feel a bit old because I've been teaching with this company for now for more than 18 years. But with that section 172, it will require some attention and some comment in today's discussion. So let's focus in that governance aspect in the United Kingdom. So the stewardship code is a body of soft law enacted under the principle complied or explained that impinges on companies, mainly large corporations, public companies. This principle contains now a very interesting message for those who have the burden to control and supervise what companies and directors do. Just to give you some sort of background, the stewardship code follow 
the financial crisis in 2008 and 9. And uh, the whole idea is or was to introduce a system whereby shareholders in companies, institutional shareholders in companies, should be more proactive in controlling what corporate directors do. In other words, it is the responsibility of shareholders in corporations to look at what the directors are doing and try to control and demand for directors to fully comply with the law and the regulation. And don't, uh, if they decided not to, then don't, don't regret it later. So the message was, please supervise and don't complain if you don't supervise. But the principle has evolved. And now it says, signatories systematically integrate stewardship and investment, including, and this is the stewardship element uh, pertinent to today's discussion, including material, environment, social, and government and governance issues and climate change to fulfill the responsibilities. That means there is a mandate according to this stewardship code on institutional investors that they need to demand for, from the board of directors and the company that there is need to take into account the ESG principles focusing on climate change. Otherwise, they will not, in accordance to the law, this is my interpretation, fulfill and or discharge the duties that the board of directors or directors owe to the corporate self or the corporation itself. This is the soft aspect. Now we have the hard law. And in 2006, one of the most important changes introduced to company law at large in the United Kingdom was the in this area specifically. Uh, to, be more, to be more precise, the, direct, the directorial duties were codified in 2006. So instead of looking purely on case law and, and principles spread in, in several instruments or sources, the law decided to, co to codify directorial duties and put them in order in sections 170 to 178 of the Companies Act. So the layman, lawyers, practitioners, students, and anybody with interest in this area could have the basic information at hand, easy to find. So there is a codification. However, when I read the parliamentary discussion that led the discussion of the bill before it became act, there was serious discussion about section 172 of the Companies Act. This section in general terms says that directors must discharge the duties in good faith and promote the success of the company. And in doing so, they must have regard of, and there is a long list of constituencies, they must have regard to the long-term effect of the decisions, they might have regard of the employees' rights, suppliers. They might have regards of environmental, social issues, and so on. So this was the first step in the United Kingdom to align with ESG principles, then called corporate social responsibility. But now it's ESG. And we understand that Section 172 included or include now what is defined as the enlightened shareholder value. And the enlightened shareholder value is pretty much in line with a stakeholderism. That means I have value in my company, not only when I have when I am a shareholder and the company is financially viable, but my value is enhanced when the company is recognized as a company which aligns with that response, which aligns with the society at large, or aligns 
with how responsible a corporate structure should be. Of course, you see a picture in there of money uh, or a tree growing on money, okay? And that picture has a hidden message and that is the, probably the learning outcome of my presentation today. Should we use the capital structure of a corporation for the, for the well-being of everybody? to build a greener society, to build, to plant, to harvest, to create a, a safe environment. And this safe environment goes well beyond plants or climate change. No, the safe environment involves sound structures in corporations, sound corporate governance structures in terms of inclusion, diversity, remuneration, and transparency, includes the social aspect, how we treat the stakeholders, the employees, the employees' structures, assets, profession, not by looking at, at, at employees as assets, even though they are one of the most important assets of my school, for example, are the people around me. Those are my assets without whom I could not fulfill my obligations or, or, or provide the service we are meant to provide students with in the first place how we protect that. And of course, the environment. If we, this, if we do not look after the environment, then we may have very little to fight for in the near future. That would be my take on UK. But now we have the complex area of the European Union. And this is far more complicated than you may think it is. Uh, so what is the main concern for corporations in Europe? No doubt is reporting and regulation. If, if I use something to, com to compare how hard it is, uh, when the, the financial crisis that hit badly economies in 2008 and 2009 happened, Okay, banks, for example, were at the, at the center of this turmoil. But that led to some stringent, more stringent regulation and, and accountancy standards. And banks complain, and they still do complain, that they need to report accounts or publish accounts quarterly in a very demanding and costly way. Well, that is a result of, of a crisis. That was the response uh, in terms of gaining what, or, or, or achieving transparency in the market. How can we then prove that companies aligned with ESG principles and fulfill the objectives? Well, by forcing companies to report under a very stringent regulatory framework. Now, how is done? Let's start by 12 o'clock in there. We have some directives in, in Europe. One is called Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which is replaced by the CSRD. And this applies to listed and large interest companies with more than 500 employees. We have reporting at three o'clock, the European Union Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and this is applicable as from 2024, the current year, two or companies need to comply with two of the following three requirements. If they have 250 or more employees, if the amount of assets exceeds 20 million euros, or if the, mid, if the net turnover of the company exceeds 40 million euros. So if they fulfill one of the two, two of the three in um, features, then they will have to comply and report on sustainability. At five o'clock, we find the CFDR ESG disclosure from financial institutions because financial institutions are subject to a specific or special regime we find at six or seven o'clock the 2022 proposal for human rights and environmental due diligence. And then at nine o'clock, the European Union members enacted 
enhanced ESG disclosures. And this is the purpose of the next slide, because these regulations provide the minimum that corporations should do, but not the maximum. And I and you will notice from my next slide that some countries have gone beyond this mark and even provide enhanced measures to fulfill the objectives. Some examples for you. And I brought six here. Of course, I wouldn't leave Italy outside the list. I have to put it in there. With my, my country of citizenship, I wouldn't ignore Italy. Italy. But look at France, for example, and let's pick one or two very interesting measures that these, comp these, these countries have introduced. Uh, let's say in France, for example, the second one, gender representation and pay gap report in plus 5,000 employees. That means if the company has more than 5,000 employees, the company needs to have in place a gender representation and pay gap report. How? Needs to justify why there are gaps if there is one and people are not paid the same for the same role, position, and effort. In France also, we find the supply chain environmental human rights and corruption report with companies with more than 5,000 employees. In Germany, you find regulation, local regulation, gender equality and equal pay disclosures for plus 500 employees publicly available. That means Germany is even more demanding than, than France. France requires 5,000. Germany requires only 500, literally including a very large proportion of companies set up in Germany. There is a uh, human rights due diligence in the supply chain. Uh, you understand, uh, I, 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 I'm fully aware that people understand one of the main headaches in, in corporations that technology, for example, wants to resolve is raw materials and supply chain and how we, what we can protect the environment by, by controlling the origin of the raw materials. Uh, let's find another one. Uh, for example, in Sweden, the last one, state-owned companies has have the burden especially reporting on sustainable development goals. So they need to, to report on what they're doing to achieve ESG goals. In Italy, for example, you find a very interesting one, a boardroom gender quotas. That means there must be a parity in gender at, board, uh, at the board level. Uh, that includes, that is pretty much in line with governance principles in the ESG, diversity and inclusion as member of the board. And these quotas also impinge on pay gaps uh, and justifying why people in the same position, in this, uh, with the same effort, same level of knowledge and responsibility are not on equal payment. In the Netherlands, we find uh, even more stringent principle comparing to Germany and France. Look, for example, to the square in the middle. It says gender pay review plus 50 employees comparing to 500 in Germany or 5,000 in <clears throat> France. All of this enhancing European, European Union regulation. Um, we find in Finland, I particularly found one in Finland very important for the purpose of this discussion. And it says, special disclosures relating to pollution, logging, and mining waste. That means companies will have to report on what they do with the wasted material, pollution, etc. There are two case studies that if I have the time at the end, I would like to bring on the table to explain to you what are the consequences that this could have at corporate level. This is a picture about countries and how these new enhanced 
regulation is being introduced or in the process of being introduced. So you find adequate law in France, Germany, and Norway, political processes in, in Austria, Belgium, Finland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, etc. But the work is in progress. I, I believe this information from the this NGO is a little bit dated. Uh, I would suggest that we look at it again, and probably the countries in green will be far more larger than the minimal or the three that I'm presenting here today. So how do, in my opinion, how, what is the future for the European Union in line with the ESG principle? And I highlighted five consequences or important points that we need to consider in this area. The first one is controversial. They will introduce mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. That means we will reach a point when alongside the list of the rights we have as humans, we also will have the right to have a clean globe, a clean planet. And that will be considered as human rights. Now, you are all lawyers, or the majority of the or in the audience, I, I expect be a lawyer. If we convert this into a human right, then the violation of a human right could lead well beyond pure indemnity. Because violating human rights, and you understand this better than me, could lead to liabilities that cannot be remedied on pecuniary levels or by pecuniary means could lead to incarceration, criminal activities, and you name it. The second one is the duty for directors, corporate directors to set up and oversee the implementation of the due diligence. And this leads to another important uh, example, another important area that you could explore um, if you are interested, uh, and is that directors uh, or within the framework of what directors should do for companies, you find one important duty. Uh, that is the duty of care. The duty of care, and in this jurisdiction, we call it care, skill, and diligence. However, directors could delegate certain functions. In fact, in some cases, when directors are unable, physically unable to control the entire operational matters of the corporation, delegation is compulsory. So they need to delegate, otherwise they could be negligent. But, but I know fulfilling the, 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 the obligations due to lack of capacity. Delegation means that two automatic duties are triggered. The duty to supervise those on whom you delegate authorities and the duty to monitor, excuse me. And the duty to monitor that those on whom you, are, that you have delegated actually perform the obligations well. So this principle of ESG triggers that, in my opinion, because this due diligence means that directors need to be skillful and diligent in what they do, but they also have the burden to supervise and monitor that the ESG principles are discharged in accordance with the law. So there is, we, we are enhancing the duty of care on corporate directions. The, the third one is integrate due diligence into corporate strategy. Well, yes, I, and, and you already heard me saying earlier that the stakeholders are at the core center of what corporations should be doing. Consequently, the long-term strategy of the corporation should embed ESG principles. Companies' liabilities, 
if they fail to comply with obligations to prevent, mitigate, minimize, or end adverse impacts, direct liabilities. And EU member states will have to amend, and this is probably the headache for those, for corporate lawyers in the audience, because European Union states will have to amend the directorial duties in order to include consequences of breaching this so-called human rights, climate change, and environmental issues. That means all countries will have to amend their codes, acts, and regulations, and make directors accountable for not fulfilling or complying with ESG standards. Now, this next point may look well outside the topic, but is actually not that uh, alien to what we are talking about. You heard at the beginning, uh, humbly, somebody was introducing me, and um, my colleague, sorry, uh, uh, Mindilla, I believe is her name, she was intro introducing me, and she mentioned my role in, in the insurance area. So my, my presentation will, will not be complete if I don't touch upon some insurance aspects that impinge on this area of law. More specifically, the, uh, an insurance product called directors and officers liability insurance. Now, would you agree with me that if ESG principles will, will force European Union members and even UK members UK, sorry, to amend and or enhance directorial duties. Would you agree with me that those companies who ensure directors' duties will also need to adapt their products? And the answer most probably is yes, because those products will have to adapt to what the new set of rules impinging on what directors should do, should not do, or the way things should be doing. So, what is expected from companies in the near future? Well, claims. Claims directors who are not complying or are failing to achieve promises and objectives. I don't want to elaborate too much about this because this is the, the point I'm using to close my presentation. But please, there is a reason why in that slide I, I wrote in bold failure to achieve promises and objectives for the reason I'm going to explain in a minute or so. Now look at the second bullet point, and this is real data. These are the cases we have in, in, legal, in real practice here. The majority of claims are not filed against companies, or are filed against directors and offices who move slowly towards ESG. That means, what are the claims that we see in real life? Claims against companies for not doing or not following ESG principles, or claims against companies who follow ESG principles, make promises, and did not achieve those objectives. We are expecting more regulation, and of course, the risk is increased. Consequently, the DNO insurance providers should be aware of the situation and adapt and develop their portfolios. Uh, this probably um, is, um, is redundant, this slide, because I already covered this in, in general terms and how much exposure directors could have by not fulfilling or not, or not complying with ESG regulation. Now you have a vast area or, 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 or vast possibilities leading to, to liabilities. But I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that this is more important for you as the audience. Cases, real cases concerning ESG and claims. So you have in the UK, for example, uh, the UK advertising watchdog 
and you, you have at least 60 actions for exaggerated green credentials, okay? And greenwashing is no other thing that companies misleading consumers, portraying a message that the companies are climate change friendly uh, and, trans and transpires that the company is not. This is probably what my daughter wanted to convey or the message that my daughter wanted to convey to me when I was looking at buying that furniture for the garden last year. We have the serious fraud office case of the Dodge and WS, and, uh, and that generated or, or ended in a 1.5 million fine for exaggerated ESG credentials. And the general impact that this case against this, the Deutsche Bank could have, globally speaking, could reach, according to some conservative calculations, one trillion pounds, because it could it could affect not only the core business of the bank, but also investors, suppliers, a very large level. The other one is uh, uh, the the easy one to cover is the serious fraud office are and Bowers and a scheme. And this is a fraudulent green investment. Uh, individuals who set the company up um, and then they use the proceeds of the invest the investors to have a very lavish line and, um, and buy uh, first class travel investments and houses elsewhere and live, uh, live like, like rich people. Uh, ignoring what the investment was. So they offer people to invest in, in, in this company who was meant to plant some trees in the in the Amazonian and no trees were ever planted and the money just disappeared. But this, these two were successfully convicted by the serious fraud office in the UK. Now, to conclude, before I invite, if you have any questions that which I'd be happy to answer if I can, because this is a very complex area of law. In my experience, what is the trend? The trend of cases that we see coming from the US hitting the insurance market in the UK. As I, as I said earlier, shareholders, investors, are not claiming against companies for not following or not comply with ESG principles. Those claims, I haven't seen one. However, we see claims coming from shareholders and investors against companies for not achieving the objectives or the targets or not meeting the targets they promise to the shareholders. And this creates a serious change in the way we assess directorial liabilities in corporations for these reasons. Originally, and if you look acro across jurisdictions, the nature of the relationship that exists between directors and companies is an obligation of means. That means, that means, and I for you for, 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 for confusing you, an obligation of means suggests that directors will discharge their duties if they do their best in what they do by acting carefully, diligently, skillfully. But directors do their best or the best endeavors in performing or discharging their duties without guaranteeing a specific result. No director would incur liabilities for not achieving X and Y profits to distribute as dividends at the end of the financial year. Nobody would, ag would agree to be a company director if liability could arise for not making 3 million at the end. However, when we look at the trend of cases that exist in climate change, ESG, greenwashing, and so on against companies, for not achieving targets, the question is, are we changing the nature of directorship? Are we changing for an obligation of means 
into obligations of guaranteeing a specific results. That means, could directors be liable for not achieving a reduction in the carbon print at the end of the financial year, or by 2020, or by 2030, or by 2050? Who is going to accept that liability, or sorry, who is going to accept that directorial position with such a large risk ahead in order, something that we cannot guarantee as individuals? To conclude, I am privy to two cases. So by the way, what the, the message I want to convey is that ESG is pressuring so much corporations that even the nature of directorial duties could change from obligations of means to obligations of guaranteeing a specific result, a reduction in carbon footprint, achieving less pollution, etc. Now you have cases like Shell, Clients of Earth, for example, where Clients of Earth, an NGO, acquire a very small proportion of shares in, in Shell and claim Again, Shell, because Shell originally proposed to reduce the carbon footprint by 2030 and then change their mind and move it to 2050. And they claimed that there was a breach of promises that the derivative action was unsuccessful. But you have two interesting cases I'm aware of in Nigeria, for example, and this concerned pollution. One is called Shell and the Kingdom of Okpabi, where companies, uh, Shell Corporation, through its subsidiary Shell Nigeria, polluted the Nigerian Delta. Uh, there was a spill. And oil was there was an oil spilt in the in the delta, and this ruined thousands and thousands of families who used the delta for fishing and harvesting, planting, etc. Irrigation etc. And they claim, they claim, uh, the Kingdom of Opavi claim against Shell Nigeria originally, but they knew that the prospect of getting a successful claim in Nigeria was very slim. So they decided to blame it again against the parent company Shell in the UK. That means it technically in corporate law, the idea was to pierce the veil of incorporation of Shell Nigeria and claim against the parent company. And they did not succeed. In principle, they were not going to succeed, I believe. However, bearing in mind the social impact that this claim could have on Shell, they decided to settle, and each family was indemnified with peanuts, something in the 5,000 or 8,000 American dollars per family, money which will not resolve the problems at all, because their livelihood has been ruined by this pollution. The other case is called Lungov and Beranta Resources. It's also in Africa, the Concola mines in Zambia, when one company, the majority shareholder in one company, was sued by this community because the waterways were polluted uh, in the copper mines, were polluted, and the, the families living uh, around the, the, the river were uh, prejudiced uh, 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 or, or, or this pollution caused side effects in people who die, uh, uh, lost sight, uh, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a high, high level of pollution in the water caused by the mine. And again, the majority shareholder based in the UK was challenged by this claim, trying to make the parent company in the UK liable for the wrongdoings so of the pollution in Zambia unsuccessfully. But now you see the trend. The trend is claims against parent companies for environmental damage and pollution. And I have no doubt that these claims are coming just because people are fully aware of what pollution is, ESG principles, and compliance with these regulatory measures put in place to make our planet better. And I will leave it here. Um, I, I would like to thank uh, 
the University of Mumbai, and also Dr. Al Kapatil for your kind invitation and advocate Mindija Khan for your kind introduction of myself. And I'll be very happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. And I really hope that this presentation will meet your expectations. And uh, even though it's very challenging to cover uh, such a hard topic in, in, in such a short period of time. So I, I stop sharing now and, um, and it's over to you, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful webinar. So yes, uh, we do have a couple of questions from our audience. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure you would be happy to uh, help us with those. Uh, so the first the first question is, uh, what is the biggest challenge for the CLOs that they face when they educate the companies about ESG? Uh, so I'm, I'm sure uh, the CLOs and the directors must be having some kind of tiff uh, because ultimately we have seen from your slide on, I suppose, the slide number three, where you did show about how the profits go down. Uh, when they are trying to uh, comply with one of the factors of ESG. So uh, the, uh, the yeah. audience just wanted to know what what is the biggest challenge that the CLOs face there? Well, uh, the biggest challenge is, um, I, I actually am very glad that you are asking me that question because I would call it a double edge sword. Uh, a challenge could be, well, of, of course, a diminution in profits, no doubt, will lead to claims. Uh, very dissatisfied investors. And you, you we, we saw the trend, yes, uh, profits going down. Um, so, yes, that could lead. It could be a challenge for, for CEOs uh, for not making companies as profitable as promised. But on the other hand, uh, if the diminution in income it correlates with the implementation of ESG principles, then they would escape certain claims and liabilities for being fully ESG compliant. The risk, in my opinion, is, and I have no doubt, and I really hope that uh, it, it does not translate or in, in, uh, in, into or maturity to reality, but my my perception is that we cannot pretend that chief executive officers and company directors are bound to achieve a specific objectives in companies because that would create an impossible task for company directors. Liabilities would arise everywhere. And most importantly, it would be very in, almost impossible for insurance companies to agree to cover such large, large, large risk. I could use my best endeavors to achieve a, spe a specific target. What I cannot agree on is on achieving that target because that is that escapes my control and there are too many variables that could impinge on whether or not that target is achieved and so on. Let's use it as an example, okay? Uh, a, a very normal example. You, All of you and I work in a university. Let's suppose that my university says to me, uh, Adolfo, I appoint you a dean of law, uh, but the condition for you to be a dean of law is that you need to recruit 300 students, okay? And then I agree to recruit 300 students. Could I retain my job if 300 students are not recruited? Or would, would it be easier for me to agree to do the job if I said, I'll do my best to recruit 300 students, but I cannot guarantee that I will. And this is the risk. If the duty transformed from an obligation of means, doing your best to achieve an objective into an obligation of result, achieving that objective, then we will find very challenging days for corporate directors, insurance, and the entire structure of the governance of these companies. That would be my the answer to, 
to that particular question. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That brings me to my next question. And I think you have mentioned that a couple of times in your presentation also. Uh, on slide number 10, uh, there, were, there were two statements which you had mentioned over there that companies who had already agreed to on some ESG levels and did not meet those were penalized. Whereas the ones who had not even started with the ESG regulations and were slow in implementing were not you know, uh, penalized or were not looked upon. Would that kind of negatively impact, wouldn't that uh, negatively impact the ones who are complying or? Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 I get your question. It's very interesting again. Um, uh, but but let me issue a disclaimer. I, I, I'm reporting to you what, what I see as a trend in claims. Uh, I, 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 I may not agree with what is happening, but the claims we are seeing reaching courts and arbitration are claims against companies who fail short, who fall short in achieving objectives. But yes, I, I agree with your point. If companies start to realize that if they don't follow ESG, the, the likelihood of incurring uh, or, or facing claims is is is, is, is a smaller. Right, right. Okay. Then they, 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 we are discouraging people or discouraging companies for for doing it in the first place. Okay. Uh, but don't forget that there, there are several penalties, fines behind this, and you could be given deadlines, uh, meeting targets, and so on. And missing those deadlines could lead to financial penalties uh, against companies. Uh, but financial penalties imposed by regulators. But my comment referred to claims reaching courts, right. dispute right. resolution. Right. And the claims are you promise X plus one, you deliver X, you owe me the plus one. And this is the reason why I'm claiming. But your point is very interesting. If the trend carries on, with claims against companies who fall short and no claims against companies who don't even follow the rules, then we are discouraging ESG uh, altogether. And that is very worrying, I believe. It's a very Absolutely. worrying thing. Absolutely. Um, uh, hopefully the last question which I have is, uh, what are the top priorities for companies uh, regarding ESG between the E, the S and the G? Uh, is there is there a trend that you see that the E is more prioritized or the S is more prioritized or the G is more prioritized? That is the most difficult question I've been asked today. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Honestly, I I don't even have the answer to that one because I equate them all, let's uh, say, on equal levels. I put them all on equal levels. But let, let's talk individually. Uh, good, could a good company uh, with our proper governance function? The answer is probably not. I don't. I I, I put governance uh, uh, at the center of the discussion because if the government, the governance of the company is sound, is competent, then the E and S will follow. That's how I see it. Right. So if you have in the structure the right governance. Right governance means that the environmental objectives will be achieved, the social impact of the corporation will take will be taken into account. So, in my opinion, I probably am biased on this being a corporate lawyer, but I would say to you, I would prioritize governance because good governance could lead to not only good G, but also to good E and S. That's how I see it. Right. So so it's it's like uh, kind of having an inbuilt moral, um, ethical uh, principles in the governance. Of Embedded in the governance. Right. If you embed in the governance of the corporation, right. the ethical aspect of this discussion, then S and G, sorry, S and S, sorry, E and S will follow. This is the natural effect of having the, the ethical principle embedded in the right. governance of corporation. I, I would I would I would agree with you on that one. Yes. All right. I I think I, I'm at the end of all the questions that were asked, and so thank you so much for your insightful discussion. Uh, now I would request Bindya Ma'am to take over for the vote of thanks.
Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Prachi. Uh, so nice and so kind of you. So on behalf of Mumbai University Department of Law, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Alka Ma'am, Dr. Professor Adolfo Polony, colleague Prachi, and all the dedicated staff and viewers who contributed to the success of our YouTube webinar today. Your expertise, dedication, and active participation have truly enriched the webinar, making it an insightful and memorable event. Dr. Alka Ma'am and Dr. Pauline Sir, your invaluable insights and guidance have eliminated various aspects of the topic, leaving us with a deeper understanding. We also extend our sincere appreciation to colleague Prachi and all the staff members who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the smooth organization and execution of the webinar. Your hard work and commitment have not gone un unnoticed. Last but not least, we are grateful to all the viewers who took the time to attend the webinar engaging in fruitful discussions and contributing to the exchange of knowledge and ideas. Thank you once again to everyone involved for your unwavering support and dedication. We look forward to more enriching collaborations in future. Warm regards. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much so for inviting sir. me. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I I, I enjoy this and. Uh, so we are very thankful to you and accepted our invitation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'm going to now stop this recording. So with this, uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, Dr. Adolfo, thank sir, you. India. And thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. Have thank a good day, sir. Thank you. Um, have thank a lovely you, day in, in India. You. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.